So given continuation of chapter 12 of the gospel according to the spirit is, and I always like to remind ourselves that this is the gospel in accordance with spirit is, it's not the gospel. The chapter deals with love your enemies. Today we start with, if someone strike, strike your right cheek, give him the other also. Perhaps one of the most misunderstood and controversial statements of Christ that has been used so many different ways. Unfortunately, very often, each one of us using it to our own advantage is to stand off place in the teachings of Christ above our, our own private interest. But let's see um, what this piece says about it. Um, so Ryder, did they read for us? Yes. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Number seven. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone <coughs> you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who will borrow from you. Matthew. All right, you go ahead and read. Okay. Number eight, the prejudices of the world, which we have agreed to call a point of honor. Give them a shady susceptibility born of pride and exaltation of personality, which leads humans to render insult for insult, insult, injury for injury. And that seems justice for one whose moral sense has not risen above earthly passions. This is why the Mosaic law said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a law which, which was in harmony with the time when Moses lived. Then Christ came saying, render good for evil. He also said, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. To the proud, this maxim sounds like cowardice because they do not understand that there is more courage in bearing an insult than in taking revenge. And that always because one does not wish, wish it to be carried beyond current time. Should we, however, take this maxim to the letter? No, no more than the one that says to plug out your eye if it is a cause of scandal to you. Pushed to its ultimate consequences, it would condemn any rep repression, even when rightful and legal, thus leading the feel free to wicked individuals by taking away all fear from them. If their aggressions were not curbed, soon all good persons would be their victims. The very instinct for self-preservation, which is a law of nature, says that an assassin's neck should not be stretched out on a voluntary basis. With those, with those words, Jesus therefore did not forbid defense, but rather condemned revenge by saying to turn the other cheek to the aggressor when the right cheek has been, been struck. He meant to say in another form that no one should render evil for evil, that humans should humbly accept all that tends to lower their pride, that it is that it is more glorious for one to be struck than to strike and to patiently endure an injustice than to commit one oneself, that it is better to be deceived than to be deceitful, to be ruined than to ruin others. It is at the same time the condemnation of the duel, which is nothing other than a manifestation of pride. Faith is, few, is future life faith in future life and in the justice of God, which never leaves evil unpunished, can alone give the strength to bear patiently any attacks on our interests and our self-esteem. This is why I keep saying, look forward. The higher you rise in thought above material life, the less you will be offended by things of the earth. Thanks. 
I think this this statement of Christ is perhaps the greatest derogation of a pride as we understand it. That I must defend my honor, I must defend my pride at all cost. Which word that I must value this one existence, my physical presence here now, above my existence as an eternal spirit in the pathway to the perfection that awaits me. Which equals to say that I better get stuck at this time in the present than look ahead in the future. And that's why the, the, the spirit over here says that for as long as we look ahead in the future, we can much better have the strength to deal with the hardships imposed to us in this present existence, in this moment in time that we are living. And it is because that we seek to stay stuck in the present, there is stay stuck in the past. And that's why the Hammurabi law that was established way before Moses was repeated at the time of Moses because it was still applicable at the time. A knife for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, it still prevails to this day. What would be that, 5,000 years already or 6,000 years already? Even after Christ comes in and say, listen guys, I know the laws. I know what has been said in the past. I am able to tell you to differentiate from you the divine laws that are <clears throat> eternal for being perfect, for come from the divinity, from all the laws that has been created by man for the necessity of the moment. But because we are, Perfectives, perfect, because we have the gene to perfection. We are in the pathway of progress. So all the laws that are man-made must be upgraded as we progress, as we move. So now I'm coming telling you, love your enemies. Now I'm coming telling you, if someone strikes on the right, give you also the left. As in a way to tell us, there was one time that perhaps a knife or a knife was the best that we as human beings could achieve in terms of maintaining some kind of order in the society that we live. But we cannot maintain ourselves stuck in that moment because we have the seeds for perfection we are moving on so i'm bringing you a new paradigm if the hammurabi laws that was taken by moses sometime later was still applicable was still the best for the times no longer let's move let's move on i'm bringing you something else that works much better that will make our society a much better place to live and that is love your enemies if someone causes you harm do not give harm back if someone seeks to hurt you, do not seek to hurt back. If someone gives you the side of hate, give the side of love. If someone gives you the side of destruction, give them the side of rebuilding. This is what it really means. Unfortunately, those of us 
we still have the instinct of aggressiveness within us, we cannot take this um, new paradigm yet. And <clears throat> coming from where we are coming from, perhaps all of us have a little bit of that instinct of ag aggressiveness, instinct, instinct of, um, of an aggression that kind of resembles, but it's not the survival, the survival instinct, the self-defense instinct. We use that as an excuse to apply our aggressiveness, our instinct of violence yet. But if you remember, if we study instinct in the Spirit's book, the instinct is a almost like a prerequisite to reach intelligence. And we have to rise above instinct and use intelligence, use reason. We are now in a time in life that reason must prevail over instincts. And if I allow that to happen, then the application of the new paradigm that Christ brings to us becomes a lot more easier. And if you understand us as someone in the pathway towards a, some kind of happiness that it cannot even express in words yet, it makes much easier for us to take a little hit now, to take the bitter medicine now, knowing that that's the bitter medicine that I will make, make me healthier and stronger ahead. We can do that. With this new paradigm of Christ, of, of course Christ did not mention that we should not have some means, some ways of controlling those who would make this, this paradigm as an opportunity, opportunity to inflict pain, to offend without dealing with the, with the necessary consequences of the actions. And that's why you would say, the Spirit says that he attacked to the extreme, you'd means condemning or repression, even when legal, and would leave the field free to evil persons by remove all their fears. Unfortunately, not everyone will mature at the same time. Not everyone will progress at the same time. And that there will be those opportunists microbes out there that will use the opportunity of causing harm to others when they feel that there is they will not have to deal with the consequences of their actions. So that mean, minimal degree of fear is still necessary. There was one time, and perhaps, perhaps not, there is still some religious in, institutions that use fear as, as a means of containing the mass, of containing the behaviors, of containing the vices of, of, of us. And they will say things that you must fear God. You must live in accordance to the teachings in this or that book, because otherwise you could have to deal with the anger of God, the things of God. If it is necessary to maintain some kind of peace, perhaps it is. I like to believe that it's not, that we have matured about that already. That again, with the new paradigm that Christ brings to us, it brings the love of caring father, not the tyrant, George, who is always ready and willing to punish and to send us to the fire of hell. So it is important that society has its means to control those who are still more likely to cause harm to offend others. And for those we have to act. But 
it should not be a punitive, it should be a corrective system. If you do offend, if you do committed acts of violence, if you do commit acts of crimes, there will be such and such, such consequences. Because it means that you need correction of the way you think, so you can probably take it, take, so that you can better act in the future. Once you learn the value of a life in community, then you can return to community. Which is different from punishing someone. Because when you punish, you are, you are retributing aggression to, with aggression. So if the daddy see the one, 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 one son hitting the sibling and goes and hit the one and say, so you see how bad it feels by giving aggression with aggression. And we as a society we cannot do that. We ne you need to move a step out of. And that's all that there is in my interpretation of the, of the meaning of give the left check back. We are not supposed to be a punch back from anyone. We are not supposed to be defenseless. We must defend ourselves. But to defend ourselves does not mean that we're going to be aggressive towards the offender. And in the next topic, and vengeance, we will see the very means that we practice this giving aggression with aggression, give hate with hate, give malice with malice in so many different ways that sometimes we may even discuss it from ourselves, yeah. but that's what we are doing. Any comments? I think this is one of the, uh, as you said, one of the hardest uh, items of the gospel because uh, the vast majority of us are not really prepared to uh, to offer the other side, right, or the other cheek, which is a figurative of, of you know, but uh, repaying uh, evil with good is something that uh, it's not instinctive for us to start with, right? You said, well, we have to move, move from instinct to reason, but, uh, but for this to become uh, ingrained uh, in our senses, for, it, for this to become a part of who we are, uh, I think it will still require many incarnations and many, uh, many, a, a lot of effort in doing it. Uh, uh, you know, because it's, again, it's, it's very easy when you read and it makes sense, but uh, when you are, when you are attacked, uh, your first reaction is to attack back. And, uh, you know, it's already a step forward when we know that uh, to reply in the same, uh, in the same way is not the right thing to do. So as a, you know, the, the change has to start somewhere. And, uh, and, I, and I think that uh, to, to be aware of it and to reread this passage and to study this passage is, is, is a huge step because from this to put in practice, I think we are still a long, long, long way to, to, to it. But uh, you know, uh, I, as I always say, we start simple, right? Someone hits you by by you know by accident on the subway instead of uh, hitting back you you know you think twice and you said well maybe he or she was having a bad day uh, move on uh, because that's the easy ones right the, the the more difficult ones when they were personally offended then it'll be a later later uh, challenge let's say yeah, and it's that way of progressing very slowly towards that 
the goal that what you just read over here, there are so far from it yet. We, we can say even ourselves, um, because as I said, it's, 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 a, it's almost an instantaneous reaction to the aggression with the aggression. It's, 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 so the pathway of we step the step is to stop the reaction that is coming automatically from you. Somebody, I don't know, curse you, you'll curse it back, right? It at least stop halfway already, you know, and not, not cause it back. Just think of doing, but not doing anymore, okay? And then it comes to the point that for most of us, I can use myself as an example, trying to better myself is to react and then say, oh my God, I shouldn't have done that. That was a bad thing of mine. This is already one step ahead, right? At one point, will you do it and feel proud? Yeah. I gave it back right away. Yeah, that's the kind of man that I am. <laughs> now, right. now, now you're doing so, man, why? Why did I do it again? And again, it's already one step forward. And as I said, I mean, you have to know, you want to get big biceps, you got to go to the gym and lift weight day after day after day after day. And that's why you do it. You know, you want to reach this level of moral conquest. This is the gym, living this life here, dealing with the things that we do every day. This is our gym. And it's by practicing that we go from being proud of giving aggression to be shameful towards ourselves, of course, when we react with aggression. That's already one step forward. But you reach one level that you even cross our mind to react that way. The, the, the reactive, the instantaneous reaction will be one of poor person. There's so, so far to go yet and move on. But yeah, we are far from it yet. But again, as Emmanuel said, if the Spirit's book is say that Jesus is the model that you have to follow, Jesus is the model that you have to follow. Are we far from it? Yes. But it is still is, is the objective that you, that you wanted to reach. And the purpose is to have a better life for myself and for everyone around me. So yeah, and step by step, little by little. And for, <clears throat> I think it's important also for us to understand in the sense of uh, <clears throat> how we think about uh, our connections to each other through the our vibrational level, right? Because the thing is, when we vibrate, uh, when we are uh, uh, hitting back, we are vibrating at the same level of the aggressor, right? So we are connecting to the aggressor and in this lower vibration. And that, that association uh, causes, uh, causes harm and um, causes harm to us and to the other, right? So the idea of... Uh, of, of uh, thinking about in terms of thought is vibrating at a different level, right? When you are, uh, when you are uh, attacked and you, you react with, uh, at least with indifference, which is already the first step, right? Not react to the same level. You are changing the vibration and you are not allowing the, the, the connection to be made between the aggressor and the, the aggressed, right? So in, in terms of understanding from the spiritual point of view and from our, uh, our mind, how our mind and our thoughts, which are our matter works, it's also important to understand uh, what we avoid by, by not reacting the same way that uh, we are uh, being active. And, and that's why I always say that the teachings of Christ, it's not a matter of religion, it's a matter of life, of, it's a matter of living our life, because as you just said, what happens when you and I at vibrate at the same level, now you beat me and I beat you back, now you beat me, then I beat you back, why do you create this cycle 
of the repetition that we keep ourselves in that thing without being able to move on. What is obsession? It's not this accumulation of aggressiveness towards one another that, that establish that strong relationship that we cannot get out of it anymore. This is obsession. We start an obsession by giving back and then the other person feels hurt and give it back to us. And then we feel hurt and give it back to them. We are obsessing one another right there. And that's why in the studies of obsessions, I like to always just try and say the most important thing, the most valuable thing is make sure that you are not the obsessor. Because we always talk about the others being the obsessor. Mm. Let's talk about us not being the subject, but being the obsessor. And the only way to eliminate this process is exactly what John said, is to elevate the quality of a vibration so you can break that cycle. There is no other way. And, and how you reach that? Offering the side of harmony when somebody gives the side of aggression. Let me read it here. To the to the end to the answer on the chat. If you are if you are uh, receiving aggression, physical aggression, should not defend ourselves. Um, even our law, even the common law protects us and suggests that we should defend ourselves. And then instead of self-defense, yes, if necessary. And it's up to the each individual to analyze and see if at that moment, when that aggression happened, my only alternative was to use of aggression, was to use of any of physical means, then yes. And I say that, that each person should analyze him or herself because you can always use that opportunity to put out all of aggressions. It's almost just as an example. I don't like my neighbor. I will provoke him until he strikes me. Then I'll Put give, give back to him all my aggression towards him, all my envy towards him. So I'm such a coward that I don't want to be the first one to hit because then I will be the guilty one. But I'll provoke him until him use of aggression towards me and I can load all my hate to him because now I am defending myself. I'm putting that out there because this is one of the things that it happens. Even our law say, if you're being an attacker, yes, you have the right to protect yourself. You have the right to defend yourself. And no one can take that. That is, that is instinct. That's the pure, true instinct of, of self-defense, of survival skills. Absolutely, yes. But then it's up to each one of us. Was it really necessary? Was it my last alternative? If that was your last alternative, yes, go ahead and defend yourself. Absolutely. No one, no one is here to be um, punch your back from anyone. And that goes for relationships, very special conjugal, conjugal relationships. Very often in the center, I have the opportunity to speak with women being difficult relationships and I always tell them, no, no one should live a life condemned to be a victim of aggression, being it physical or verbal or emotional. No one is here for this. So not only physical, but even emotional, even uh, verbal aggression. We can and we should defend ourselves. But to defend does not means, mean to agree. 
If there is a specific case, then yes. But then again, it's individual. Was that my last resort? Then yes, you're in the right to do so. And again, no one should feel themselves to be so not important or not deserving to subject themselves to a life of being a punch bag, being physical or emotional or verbal to anyone else. Yeah, I, I was thinking here, you know, I, I think uh, we should always defend ourselves. How we defend ourselves is, is a different conversation, right? Yeah. <laughs> and again, it may come to a situation which only the a physical response is the last alternative. So let it be. If it's your last alternative, let it be. Yeah, and the human law, you know, has the self-defense law, right? If uh, right. someone invades your home and you, you know, and attacks you and you kill that person, it's self-defense. Right? Yeah. And again, we have our own conscience too. That is, in the end, is going to judge us uh, if we, what we did was the best, best available uh, path, right? And again, uh, always considering that we are in perfect spirit. So we're going to make mistakes. But uh, if we really, truly believe that, uh, you know, was the best path and uh, we will face the consequences, but uh, with, according to our degree of knowledge and understanding of the situation. Yeah, and, and, and that's why the Spirit reinforced that statement in the passage that, you no know, to give the left check, that does not mean to not defend yourself. Mm. That means that do not give aggression for aggression, do not give hate for for hate, but on the contrary, you give the good side for whatever somebody gives you. Somebody gives the good side, you give the good side back. Somebody gives the bad side, you give the good side back. Mm -hmm. So regardless of what you receive, you return with goodness. Regardless of what you receive, you, re you receive it, you give back with goodness. Anna has a question that I almost can she post it on the chat. Yeah. Sorry, I'm not sure if my, yeah, my microphone okay, is. Yeah? Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, sorry, Hi, everybody. It. Good morning. morning. You got it, right? Okay, good. Yeah. Good. That's it. <laughs> Every action, there is a reaction, right? I mean, that's the law, right? Now, um, but does that depend on the, how guilty you feel, Elmo? If yeah. you are okay in your conscience that you had to do it, that was the only option, and then you're okay. Is it really conditioned to how you feel towards your action? Yeah. So you the consequence. Think this you take that on the um, at the very personal level right? because that's going to try to break down. Everyone said that somebody enters in, into my house and I shoot that person, perhaps that the the law will protect me and and say there was an act of self defense. Perhaps the the lawyer of the one who died to say, "Oh, the guy who walked into the house had had nothing in his hand, had no guns, had nothing." Um, you could just uh, tell him to leave and he would leave. There was, but you choose to choose first and dialogue second. I don't know if the judge, if if a lawyer, if it's a judge to buy that or not, but that is something to to consider. And I'm putting that out there because there is so many ways that we can 
analyze one situation, even here in our physical world, right? That it that may make a difference. Yeah, somebody walks in your in, in your house, you shoot them. Is that just it's just as simple as that? There is more to, to it, right? Take the complexity of our as a, as a spirit, all these possibilities goes even much, much, much more than that, right? So somebody walks into my house and, and, and somebody has uh, a, a gun or a knife and then says it's gonna kill me or my wife and I just happen to have a gun, which I don't, and I, and I, and I shoot back, I will, in my conscience, I like to believe that will be in complete peace that I have done the right thing. That was the last alternative that this person had a, a gun or had a knife and, and stated the, the desire of destroying myself and my family. I would sleep very well at night if I did kill that person. But that's me. Well, I like to believe that that would be the case. It never happened. I cannot say for sure that that's how it would happen, right? And to anyone else, I'd say, my friend, go and sleep well because you have done the right thing. Now, let's assume that I act the same way, but the person coming saying that is going to do this and that, but has nothing in their hands. And I still go ahead and I shoot that person. I would doubt my, my decision at that point, perhaps for the rest of my life. But every time I go to bed, I think, could I have avoided it? Could I have done better? So each situation is a situation. And then for each individual, it's a different. I mean, when you see that famous picture then at the time of the of the presidential election, and there is that beautiful image of Christ that is underneath the, the image of Christ, there is a crossed rifle over there and in, in, the, in the bottom of the crossed rifle says, in, in this house, we do not call the cops. For the owner of that house, that person would have no guilt feelings if somebody comes in the house unarmed and, and receives a bullet. The person would sleep very, very, very in peace, in very in peace. And perhaps the way that the divine just would provide the opportunities of growth to that person would be different from us while he are talking about this right now in this, having this conversation right now. Because I like to believe that we understand a little bit better than the one who puts that things on their walls. For, for us to have this conversation, as you understand that the, the image of Christ should not be hanging uh, right, right above a couple of rifles and, and, and with the statements that we don't care about the law. I like to believe that we know better and therefore the consequence of our actions will be different from those in that house. So it is very personal, yeah. very personal. So Elmo, the consequence is, is, is of course beyond just what our guilt conscious. So our yes. guilt conscious contributes to it, but yes. um, that person may sleep through the night, but there will be a different way of teaching that that is not the right way or that there are other ways of acting. So it's not right. just our, our conscious. Okay, right. thank you. Right. Yeah. Thank you. And yeah, and, and that's, uh, yeah, that's very important, Dana, because there is a divine law. And uh, when we deviate from a divine law, and these, these people are deviating from the divine law, taking, uh, taking the law in their own hands, uh, there are consequences, right? Uh, maybe they, they have no uh, 
no acknowledgement of, uh, of what they have done. They don't care. But uh, we are studying the book Liberation, right? Uh, about uh, Gregorio. He has no regrets yet. He has no, uh, he doesn't think he's doing anything wrong. Uh, but how is he opening the door to, to being rescued by his mother and the team, right? By being bored for so many centuries of doing the same thing. So, you know, eventually it will, from this being bored to being rescued to analyzing uh, his acts, he, he will come the guilty conscience and will come the, 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 the responsibility and the consequences of his actions. So these people, again, the more you know, the more responsible you are. And Elmo mentioned this very well. So. Same situation, same act, uh, the guy with the two rifles and us, we are more responsible because we know better. But the fact that we know better doesn't, uh, doesn't prevent them or also having to face the consequences of infringement of the divine law. So the conscience plays a part and will play a huge part eventually, but not necessarily immediately. Yeah. That's why I always like to say that the law is corrective and not punitive. Because if it was punitive, then it could be the same for everyone. But being corrective, it has to adjust to where we stand right now in that pathway. And yes, our, our conscience plays a big role. But very, very often is the self-imposed you know, you have to differentiate that, what is being given to us an opportunity or what we are self-imposing, what we're placing upon ourselves as an extra you no know, salt in the, in the wound. And you need to be very careful with that also. Do not let guilty be that extra salt and vinegar in the wound. Then the guilt becomes a negative thing. Okay, and from um, okay. for Marilyn, yes, we should defend ourselves. Absolutely, we should defend ourselves. We just have to measure our actions in accordance to the necessity of the moment. Okay. Let's see if I understand what she's saying here. Yeah, um, sometimes even if you, if, if you might not have a choice and you are forced to defend yourself, you may regret later the action you took, right? Yeah, it's possible, right? Yeah. Because we are imperfect, so we don't, we're not 100% sure of our, our actions. Uh, we, Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, and that's and that's what I say. That let's be careful um, to not allow guilty to be that extra salt and vinegar in our wound. Um, if the situation at that moment required you to take an action, and perhaps you actually went a little bit extra afterwards when you reanalyze and review the whole situation say oh, maybe maybe i went one step ahead maybe i went 12 steps ahead at that moment you act to the best you are your, your ability to think at that moment you couldn't do any better afterwards you reflect on it and you thought that uh, perhaps i went a little bit above don't let it be such a guilt to that that creates a problem for you, move on. Um, if you have an opportunity to repair, 
repair it, but don't let guilt be uh, something that causes you to, to have conflicts with yourself. All right. Okay. Revenge. Number nine. Revenge is one of the last remnants of barbaric customs which tend to disappear from the midst of humans. It is like the duel, one of the surviving traces of savage customs under which humanity struggled in the beginning of the Christian era. This is why revenge is, is a sure indication of the backward stage of people who engage in it and also of the spirits who can still inspire it. Therefore, my friends, the sentiment should never be harbored in the heart of anyone claiming to be a spiritist. As you know, revenge is so contrary to Christ's precept, forgive your enemies, that whoever refuses to forgive is not only not a spiritist, but not, not even a Christian. Revenge is all the more nefarious as an inspiration because it is frequently accompanied by falsehood and baseness. In fact, one who abandons oneself to such a nefarious and blind passion almost never acts in the open when taking revenge. When he or she happens to be the strongest, he or she hardly ever falls on the one they call their enemy, like a wild beast at the sight of the former who ignites their passion, anger and hatred, Instead, they, they most often take on a hypocritical appearance, hiding in the deepest of their hearts the evil fe feelings that animate them. They employ devious subterfuges, following in the shadows their suspecting enemy, waiting for the right moment to strike the latter without any risk for themselves. They hide from their enemy while constantly spying on him or her. They set up hideous traps for their enemy, occasionally pouring some poison into the latter's cup. When their hatred does not reach such extremes, they attack the enemy in his or her honor and affections. They do not shrink from common and their treacherous innuendos skillful scattered to all winds increase as they go along. Also, when the one they pursue presents himself or herself in circles where their venom has penetrated, such person is surprised to find cold continences where he or she once met friendly and benevolent faces. He is amazed when the hands of those he or she seeks now refuse to shake his or hers. Finally, this person is annihilated when his or her nearest and dearest turn and run away. Ah, the coward who takes revenge in this fashion is a hundred times guiltier than the one who goes straight to his or her enemy and openly insults the latter to their faces. Away then with these savage customs. Let us abandon these customs from another era. Any spiritist who today claims to still have the right to take revenge would no longer be worthy of joining the phallus that took as its motto. Without charity, there is no salvation. Yet no, I cannot accept the idea that a member of the great spiritist family would ever give in to the impulse of revenge instead of forgiving neighbor. Jules. The yes, Jews of Olivia in Paris, 1862. Um, so as, as, as I said before in the beginning, and it's, it's almost a repetition of what I just said. If you are in a pathway of progress, if you were being created simple and ignorant in a pathway that leads to our perfection through our own experiences,
we will start by creating rules and laws that are compatible to where we stand at that exactly moment, right? Um, like we use chronology because we don't have other means to, we cannot be measuring our moral intellectual advancement. If you will, if you have means to measure, let's say just like comparison, comparison state for us, human race in, human race, race in 2021, we would see that in, in this pathway of moral intellectual progress, our intellectual progress is quite elevated. I mean, all this technology that we have now demonstrated that we have advanced a lot. We have, to, we have taken very big steps in the last 200 years in the, in the intellectual side of our growth. And you'd see that with that, the moral side needs to catch up a little bit. And if you look back as, as early as 200 years ago, you see that we have accomplished a lot morally also. It's, we have a tendency to be negative about that, but with some reflection, in, we will see that we have made progress. If you just look at the things that was completely normal, acceptable 200 years ago today, no one accepts anymore. In terms of equalities and all of the things, you see that we have made progress as well. But it will be, be easy to see that intellectual, our wing is a little bit higher, longer than the moral. And that's what makes us to take off and fly because you need both, both wings to be about the same size for us to be able to fly. So it's this time and moment in our lives that we have to perhaps give a little pause, reflect a little, a little bit, and allow the moral side to catch up with the, with the intellectual so you can fly. And, and it is with this in mind that at one point, a knife for an eye was a damn good law. It was a, such a more intellectual progress that I had to achieve. Today, Gandhi has already told us, if you use that, you're gonna be a society of, of blind people. A knife for an eye does not cut anymore. And just about 2000 years ago, Christ came in and told us, hey, I bring something new. Let's forget a, this, a knife one now. Now you have grown up above, above this one yet. That, this is a close that doesn't fit you anymore, basically. You have to dispose of that and get one that fits you now. And that is forgive your enemies. Do not give aggression with aggression. Peter, put it down your sword for the one who, who kills by the sword dies by the sword, right? So there's so many teachings that from him that tells that you have a new paradigm now, we have grown up. And that's why the spirit, the spirit Olivia say over here that this is one of the vain vengeance of revenge is one of the last remains arising for barbaric customs, a knife for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, right? It's one of the last rem remnants arising for barbaric customs that tend to be erased among, uh, amongst human beings. Now it's up to us to, to erase it individually for ourselves. I can only do it for myself. I cannot erase that for my wife, for my kids. I can serve as an example. Hopefully they'll take that example, but I have to do it myself first, right? Then perhaps I, I may be an example for us to follow through. That's all that I can do, right? Now, <clears throat> it's, it's pretty obvious that we would like, like to have completely erased that from us. Have we? Each one of us has to answer that question, right? 
the plain fact that you are living here now in this world of trial and expiation, chances are that there is still a remnant of that little bit of the desire for revenge, for vengeance in each one of us is still lingering around. Because if you have completely erased it, there was definitely not a part of us, there's a good chance that we did not need to be incarnated in this world anymore. And what Olivia speaks to us about now and makes us reflect is, is in the many ways that we hide this sentiment. That we use our intelligence to disguise the remnants of this, this, of this sentiment within us still. Um, If someone comes and offends us or hurts us, and we go explicit out loud and say, I do not forgive, I will have my day, he, she will pay me a penny by penny everything he does to me. You are clear about that. You come out loud and say, this is what I am, this is what I have in my mind, this is what I have in my heart. I do not forgive, and now we'll make sure that he or she will pay. And we pay with interest. We're pretty clear about ourselves. How many of us does that? And how many, how many of us have that sentiment but not leave it so obvious, so clear, like that. A lot of us take the hypocritical approach to act in our, on, our, on our sentiments, on our desire to make him or she pay for everything that, the pain that he or she caused me. And that's what Olivia talks about here. Because if you think about, in order for, for us to have the sentiment for vengeance or for to give back, somebody has to do something to us. Or we may have the perception that someone have offended us. Because they're two different things, right? Unfortunately, there are those people People that are always the victim. They always they see everything that happens to them as an attack, as an offense. So that I did direct offense of attack, somebody done something direct towards me, or somebody does something that I receive it, I perceive as an offense. And I have to offend back. It's two different situations, right? Um, and then we make the choice. We make, the, we make a choice to, yeah, I received that offense. It was indeed that of, an offense. It was something an attack against me. And I choose, I choose to retribute at the same level. Or I choose to follow Jesus' advice and give the other side. I like to use the word a cho choice because indeed it is a choice. It is a choice that we make. Somebody, let's say, like when, when I was a, was a kid, so the biggest thing that it could do, if you want to fight with someone, you just curse okay. that that someone's uh, mother in front of everyone else. If you want to fight wrong when we are you know, nine years old in the back in the, in the schoolyard, and I want to fight with wrong, I just have to curse his mother in front of everybody. Now wrong has to react. It's a pride. You no, know, it's the nine years old at my age, not the nine years old today anymore. They're too busy doing the, the games thing. They don't fight anymore, <laughs> thank God. 
but you know we're 90 years old. If you just want to fight someone, all you have to do is offend the mother in front of everybody else. Now Joan gonna have to react. Otherwise he is a coward, he is afraid, he is a chicken, he is whatever the 90 years old say. Unfortunately, we grow up wanting the same kind of attitude. So I will choose to offend someone expecting retribution so I can really bring down all my, my aggressiveness over all my violence toward that person, towards anyone else. I just have so much within me that I have to put it out. And when I find a victim, I'll do that. So I, I provoke people so people seek to revenge against me and I can give my load of violence towards them. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> now, that person that I, that, that I offended, or that person that I even choose to offend, expecting that we can engage in some kind of cyclical aggressiveness, because that I have so much inside of me that I have to put it out, I have to get it out of me somehow. That person is, you'll be direct and we will res respond right away, open, or we will be use of tactics. You'll be more um, politically correct, so to say, in their way of, of seeking revenge. And we use of strategies that will affect the offender, that will hurt the offender in a more indirect way. And that is perhaps what uh, Oliver speaks over here is the one that is perhaps even the worst, the more coward, the hypocritical one. So somebody offends me, somebody hurts me. Um, I don't have the means to attack that person directly, perhaps that person is stronger, is more powerful in many different ways, financially, physically, or, or whatever, or, or, or influences much more powerful than I, and I have to find a way to retribute aggressive, aggressiveness with aggressiveness, hurt with hurt in a different way. So I create my plans, whatever that may be, in according, in according to that situation. And I go to seek my revenge because I'm not able to forgive because my honor is offended with a sign of this negative pride that I have to free ourselves from it. And I create all kinds of situations in which I will give back, I will seek my revenge in a more indirect way, but he or she will pay for what have they done for me if not direct. Again, somebody hurt me and I'll go out loud and let everybody know I am offended, I've hurt, I have my, I feel that my honor uh, is deflated and I have to inflate it back. And I can only do that by giving back to that person the same thing that I receive. I believe that the only way that I can alleviate my pain is if I pass that pain back to the other person at the same level, which naturally is a big mistake. And it's a big mistake because it's never enough. That's what I always say now, it's with center when you speak with spirits who are feel to be in the right of making justice through their own hands. And here's a, here's a very important point is that they, truly feel that they are in the right, they are acting in the right way. They are doing what needs to be done correctly to make justice. They, the only thing that they say is, says, <clears throat> we, we make justice differently. The hardest part is to convince them that, no, that's, you're not really making justice because you don't know justice. We don't know justice. We are way too far to comprehend justice. 
And that's why Jesus teach us to live justice at the hands of the one who knows it. The dividing laws will take care of that. The dividing laws is perfect. You take care of that. That when you seek to, to make justice to our own hands, we are, we are just, just incrementing all our responsibilities with that divine laws. We are only, only making our pathway more difficult step by step. That's the hardest part to, the hardest part to, to have dialogue with those individuals is that they are absolutely convinced that they are doing the right thing. That a knife for a knife, a tooth for a tooth, is the divine, the law, is what needs to be done. So if you cannot do, some of us, we cannot do it directly. You know, if someone is much stronger than us, physically, financially, fi uh, in influences and whatever, we cannot act at the same level, we will act in a different way. You no, know, in a very silly way, it's like, if the only thing that I can do is to scratch the guy's car when I pass by, it's the only thing that I can do, that's what I'll do it. But you do something that makes you feel good, <laughs> by causing harm to other person, even if it's only scratching, his or her car. That's all that I can do when nobody's seeing. The problem is if it's today with technology, there is always somebody seeing. <laughs> You're going to get caught. There's always a camera somewhere that is going to catch you. And you're just going to be even more trouble now. Come to the point now that every time that you commit an act of revenge, it seems that you don't want to get caught. The first the one who caused the first infraction continues to go free. As you see very often in sports, so people who watch sports is the one who attribute who will get caught, who get the yellow card, they get the, the red card. The first one who committed the first infraction, nobody saw it. But we feel the pain. You react right away, we get punished. Very often the one who committed the offense against us and such a level of ignorance that the consequence for him is much smaller than for us if you retribute because you know better we are in a better position the more you know the more you're responsible for it just spoke you know that's another bad thing of this this desire for revenge we know better <laughs> You know, you have read this. You have read these things. We have you have this new, this new paradigm that Christ bring bring for us, and big reasons for why it works better. We just spoke of it. You need to get out of that cycle of violence against violence against violence against against violence. Now I can inflict the pain I do so. Tomorrow, be in a less privileged position. The other one is be in a better position than I, you hurt me. And then you go accumulating hurt versus hurt versus pain versus pain, and you create that cycle that is nothing more than obsession right then and there. Until someone decides to break that cycle by elevating, vibrate at a higher level. And now at the high, at the vibrate at higher level, you have the responsibility of bringing the other one back to that to that level of the, what you are right now. And that guy, because that person is suffering the consequences of your action and her action, or, or his or her action as well. But you are also responsible. Now you have the responsibility of bring that person out of that cycle, him or herself. And if you truly regret, that's the step that we take right there. After every regret comes reparation. So he says, if you are an spiritist, I think it's, it's very optimistic for him to think the fact 
that we become optimistic, those thoughts doesn't cross our mind anymore. I wish I could say that because if that was an absolute prerequisite, I would not be a part of this community. But I think to be a part of this community is to have this understanding <clears throat> and to have as an objective to reach this level of moral progress. Okay, comments? Carol. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, also we can add in um, social media. The sparring is endless. It's uh, our, our era, I guess, of dealing with it or working it out, but it's uh, pretty intense. It's pretty intense. Thank you. Yeah. I think we still uh, we still a long way to learn how to deal with the social media because it's a recent phenomenon, right? So we we need to to still learn better. You know, it's uh, not much different from internet, also, right? Which is a little older than uh, than social media, but uh, we're still uh, not fully um, understanding how to deal with. But uh, the the, the you know, everything has its positives and negatives. So of course, social media has a lot of positives, right? A lot of uh, enable people to be in close contact with their loved ones at a distance, it enable people to be in connection with uh, with people that share the same, the same uh, feelings and same ideas. But the problem is on the other side is that uh, it, it can create fanaticism, it can create uh, Isola isolationism in, in groups that uh, you know uh, conspire thinking that they're the only ones right and, uh, and it can be very shallow also in a sense right uh, because it uh, it moves us away from uh, uh, from investigating a little bit more and studying a little bit more but um, but it's always progress right so the way that uh, it's we're going to adjust it to to our to our best interests is a work in progress like everything else that all the innovations are right uh, you know uh, when we we start having radio in the 1920s that uh, there were people saying that that was a instrument of the devil and nowadays you know radio is so way behind <laughs> we have so much more so all innovations will have backlash and we will have adjustments and uh you know i uh, i think it's uh it's an, a, a very useful instrument that we need to learn how to use better and how to direct to to the progress of humanity but uh, it will be a trial and error right Elmo. there's there's another neutral instrument that does not carry a, a quality per se, it's completely neutral. And we will carry the qualities of its user. It will resemble the moral qualities and the intellect qualities of its user because by itself is absolutely neutral. You know, a, a dollar bill in a counter is just a piece of paper. It has, it has no quality. It's what, what we use it for, what we do with that, that qualifies it of being a good thing in your hands or not. The social media the same way, it, re, it reflects the moral stage of, of our society, or at least it reflects the moral stage of those who want to use that to put out, to show off the quality, the, their moral or intellectual qualities. The problem, um, in my personal opinion, there's again, very personal opinion, is to paraphrase um, Martin Luther King when he says, my fear is not the bravado of the bad, but the silence of the good. 
So if there are so many out there using the social media, using the internet, for all the, let me put it a very ample way, anti-Christ design, uh, desires, perhaps we should use it and put it there with our Christian uh, statements, at least to counterbalance the, in a, in a, in a little, little bit. Because unfortunately, the, the evil doers, the ones with ill sentiments, are very loud. They make a lot of noise. And the good ones, they are out there, choose to, to be silent. And I think comes a moment that, as Martin Luther King says, that you know, we have to try to counterbalance it a little bit. Yeah, I was, I was listening to uh, to a talk uh, from a, a very uh, you know someone in Brazil that is becoming very uh, knowledgeable and uh, has very good uh, talks and uh, and he was he was discussing the political mo uh, moment that uh, in Brazil is not much different from here and. Uh, and there is, a, you know, of course, with spiritism so so much bigger in Brazil, so many more people. There are questions, you know, spiritists should be involved in politics. Spiritists should be involved in, in all these uh, current uh, issues. And uh, his his answer was, you know, very interesting. He said, uh, "Spiritism is not from the right and not from the left. It's from above." <laughs> spiritists have a duty to live in society. And that means that uh, you have to be involved according to your own personal opinions, but you cannot bring politics into spiritism, into spiritist centers. You have to make a distinction. But, um, but uh, when you ask, uh, should a spiritist run for, for Congress or something like that, he said, of course, why would we live for the others? You know, you have to be involved, but how you behave once you are there as a true spiritist or as all the others is what's going to make a difference. So, because if you have true spiritists uh, in, uh, in, in key uh, positions in politics, the tendency, it's not guarantee we are all imperfect, is to have a better quality of politics, right? So it was very interesting because uh, there is a lot of uh, people in Brazil that say, oh, spiritists should, shouldn't get involved with politics because this, is, this doesn't belong. Well, if you don't get involved, someone else does, right? What I almost just said, Martin Luther King's phrase, if you allow everybody else to run the show, uh, then the consequences, you are responsible for the consequences for avoiding to get involved into it. But there is a difference between, you know, you personally involving and uh, involving spiritism into politics, which is a different thing. I thought it was very good. I agree. I mean, it's, the problem is that we, we create these negative connotations. That's my, my speech of being create those negative connotations to words and uh, being very sensitive to, to words. The politics today have a real negative connotation that say, oh, spiritual has to be above politics. I mean, that's such a stupidity, I'm sorry to say, be very honest, that's unbelievable. So let's take the, the, the correct word, the correct meaning of the word, right? Because politics, when it was created, invented by the by the Greek, it is in the in the in Plato's um, um, what was what is the Plato's the cave? Um, uh, the uh, the the cave. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot. Yeah, the the politician is the one who is able to leave darkness, achieve light, and then go back to retrieve the others. Isn't that a wonderful thing to be an spiritist politician? To reach the light and then sacrifice oneself to go back and retrieve the words and bring the, the order to the light? 
So politics is a wonderful thing if you use it the right meaning to the word. And we all should use. And the same thing that you now going back to care, the social media, the internet, it's a wonderful tool to help people to, to bring everyone to the light as much as we can. But at, at, at least to try to neutralize all the negative voices, all, all the bravado of the of the bad. Put something good over there. If not, if nothing else, at least to kind of balance. So you can look at social media. It's not such an evil thing anymore because it's neutral. It's absolutely, it's not good, it's not bad. Is what we do with it that qualifies it. It, it, it will take the, the color of our moral qualities. It's an empty canvas that we can paint in accordance with what you have in our heart. And if you live only for the bad ones, as Martin Luther King would say, then it's gonna be a pretty ugly picture. If you leave that space only for the people with ill intentions to run the governments, to run the, the, the police uh, departments, to whatever, what do you expect? What do you want? So we, we need to be, and it's purely a decreasing status, proactive. You need to act, otherwise you don't have the right to complain. Yeah, you just have to read the biography of uh, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, you know, there was a there is a recent there was one written by a media that uh, would uh, conduct se sessions on Abraham with Abraham Lincoln and his wife, and uh, and you see how, you know, how a politician can be. Uh, a game changer and uh, act on the best interests of of all with all the problems and the issues because of course we we have a problems and issues and tough decisions have to be made but uh, you know if you can have a neighbor in Lincoln why can't we have uh, someone like him today right they're out there that's right Um, we have time for one more. I think we should stop here, right? I want five minutes left. Five minutes. Yeah. If anybody has a comment? Did you try to say something, Marilyn? No. No, I thought she, I thought she, she raised her hand, but I guess not. I really so, love being here every Sunday. It's um, one of the bright spots of my week. And um, I thank you for letting me come in. Well, thank you for being a part of it. Yes. You all contribute to it. You can be sure of that. So next Sunday, we'll be uh, studying on the way to the light. And uh, we are almost at the end of the book. I don't know if we're going to finish next Sunday or in another month, but uh, we're almost finishing it. Okay. Um, I'll make the final prayer to close unless anybody has any more comment. as we come to the end of this meeting of the blessed opportunity to reveal the teachings of our master Jesus Christ the blessed opportunity to reason on his teachings we give thanks to God for his divine providence, 
to our Master Jesus Christ for being with heart with us every time that we unite ourselves in His name. Give thanks, beloved Master, for the peace that you bring for us. We give thanks for the benefactors, the spiritual friends of SDNY, for our guardian angels, protecting spirits. In this time of So many serious challenges that we are facing. We know how privileged, privileged we are to have accepted this doctrine as a tool to assist us to, to progress, as a tool to assist us to endure the hardship to endure the difficult lessons that some of us are undergoing with the certainty, with the reasonable faith that these are our precious tools to assist us, to elevate ourselves. Give us dear God, the strength, the courage, the discipline to put your will above ours, ours now and always, to maintain our fidelity with you, with your divine laws, that we may be able to contribute in any possible way. to assist our brothers and sisters on their going trials that are much greater than ours. That will send our vibrations of love, of peace, of renewed hope and faith for those suffering. All the storms, the natural, and then man-made calamities. That so may, maybe may have a peaceful, productive week. That our homes, our houses, our hearts and minds be filled with the peace of Christ. And we desire to ask permission to close this meeting, so be it.